It is Connor's birthday. <laughs> on the third holiday. Judy, what holiday is it today? The governor sent out greetings. Uh, the beginning of Purim. It's Purim or Purim. Oh, Purim. It is the very holiday that the book of Esther sets us up to remember. Esther is the origin story of Purim or Purim. I don't care how you pronounce it. Um, it comes from the poor, the lot that Haman cast to decide the date for the destruction of the Jews. That and obviously, you remember from last week, the whole plan backfired. And God rescued and saved his people. So today, with Purim and Palm Sunday coming together, we're going to celebrate the God who controls the casting of lots. Our God, and the Bible says this about God. People, you and I, we cast lots to make decisions. We use chance to make decisions. You flip a coin to decide who receives and who kicks off. But it is God who makes the choice. God chose us. On Palm Sunday, we remember Jesus walking into Jerusalem, knowing the cross was in his future because you and I were on his mind. He went to the cross for us. With that in mind, let's start with our Palm Sunday reading from John chapter 12. A great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way into Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and blessed is the king of Israel. Then Jesus found a young colt, and he sat down on it, as it was written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion, for your king comes to you seated on a donkey's colt. With that in mind, we offer Jesus our own hosannas and praises in our first song, reminding ourselves the great things that he has done for us. Please stand, join me in singing.
celebrate the greatest thing God has done. God has chosen to love us. He made a decision long ago to put his, human, to put his lot in with us. He could have turned from us at any time. He could have walked away. But he chose not to. It makes him our great God, where at the very mention of his name, we are reminded of his awesome power, but mostly his awesome love. Please join me in singing at the mention. Fear no evil, I will take courage. The words of the 12-step program are as we take a fearful and a fearless inventory of our heart. We get to look inside to see the parts of us that are broken, that don't work. And we get to take them to Jesus and bring his forgiveness to bear on them. We bow our heads. God, we come before you and we ask for your help in making a fearless and searching moral inventory. Show us what's wrong, what's broken. Lead us by the power of your Spirit to confront what's sinful in our lives, where we have turned against you, 
whether it's in thought, word, or deed, the attitudes of our hearts, the things that we think but don't even say. Father, reveal our sin to us so that we can repent of it, so we can turn from it, so we can see its cost and consequence and then come and look at the cross and see Jesus there carrying our sins for us. Help us to live in that forgiveness that comes from you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, the forgiveness that we seek comes not because we earn it, deserve it, or merit it in any way, but simply because our Lord loves us. Please join me in singing, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus said, no greater love has this than a man lays down his life for his friends. And then he went to the cross and laid down his life for you and for me. It's my joyful duty as God's called servant in this place to announce that full forgiveness in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated to hear from God's Word. Good morning. Good morning. Our Old Testament reading is from the book of Esther. Haman had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the poor, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head and that he and his sons should be killed. Therefore, these days were called 
the Purim, from the word pur. Our second Old Testament lesson is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 3. The lot is cast, but its every decision is from the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel today is from the book of John, chapter 19, verses 23 and 24. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Those, so this is what the, Lord, the soldiers did. Thank you, Kathy. We continue our service by confessing our faith together. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed this morning. I believe in God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of, of heaven and earth, and, earth, and in Jesus Christ, Christ his only Son, Son our Lord, Lord, who was conceived, conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, died, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. So for our object lesson today, we want to talk about casting lots. Uh, this is probably what the lots look like that Haman cast. Um, these are sheep knuckles. Uh, and that's, I, I checked archaeologists, and they said about that time, that's what people used. Um, so Haman would have taken a couple of sheep knuckles and decided this is the date for the destruction of the Jews. And back then they were called poor which is why today is Purim, the celebration of God overcoming that wicked plan. A few hundred years later, Roman soldiers, well, this is what their lots looked like. This probably looks pretty familiar to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, six sides, the whole, you know, you know, all the things that you and I looked for with, we were going to gamble with dice. Um, Lots have been cast by people when people need to make a decision and they're not sure what to do. At the start of a football game, do you receive or kick off? Well, you flip a coin. You decide by chance. So our Old Testament lesson says in one way that, yeah, humans flip the coin, humans cast the dice, but every decision belongs to God. But I think of those Roman soldiers gambling for Jesus' clothes at the foot of the cross they think they're making a decision. Who gets that fifth and final piece of clothing? But the real decision is on the cross. Jesus is deciding to save us. Our God chooses us. He loves us in grace. And he makes a choice. So yes, the lot is being cast. But the decision belongs to the Lord. And God decided to love and save you and me. With that in mind, we sing our next song, Awe, to remind ourselves of the greatness of the God who loves and saves us.
Thank you, folks. So when Palm Sunday falls on Purim, it made sense to think about the events that Palm Sunday leads us to. Jesus walks into Jerusalem to the adoration of the crowd, knowing full well that in a few days' time, their hosannas will turn into crucify him because he knows the cross is in his future. He knows that scripture will be fulfilled. They gambled for my clothing. The Bible says that human beings cast lots. We roll the dice. But God alone makes the decision. In Holy Week, we remember that God made his decision for us. He decided to choose us and to love us. That is the message that I want us to carry home today. And with that, I want us to live with a confidence. A confidence that allows us to face the challenges of the day knowing we're loved. Knowing that God is actually choosing us, that he is on our side. We can face a lot of different challenges, a lot of different false beliefs that the devil would like to give us to take away our confidence, to take away the hope that we have that is ours as God's chosen people. First off, there's, there's the people who believe that there really is, are, there really are Hamans out there. There's cabals of evil people who are attempting to do us harm. And as a result, they live with a certain level of fear rather than a confidence that God is with us. So I would like us to live with confidence rather than that fear. I think we can be confident rather than feel powerless. As the Roman soldiers stripped Jesus of his clothing and, and decided to gamble for it, I can only imagine the rage that his disciples must have felt as they were watching that abuse of power, that casual acceptance of violence. But they couldn't do anything. And sometimes people give in to that sense of hopelessness and anger that there's just nothing we can do rather than live with the confidence that God has chosen us. And finally, there's just the folks who forget about God altogether and just see our universe as sort of this, this careless place. It's random choice. And the only power that there is is entropy as everything gradually winds down. But we get to live with something different. We get to live with hope. We get to live with confidence because we believe that God has chosen us. That Jesus willingly went to the cross for us. Palm Sunday begins the observation of the events of Holy Week as we walk closer and closer to Jesus' death and his resurrection. And every year we remember his sacrifice on our behalf. I always find it helpful to remember that Jesus at any time could have walked away from this. He could have gone into the chants of the crowd on Palm Sunday and snuck out another gate, but he didn't. He stayed put. When he went out to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, he could have just walked over the hill and in a few miles he would have come to Lazarus' house. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus owed him a favor. He could have stayed there, but instead he stayed in the garden. He stayed there until Judas came to betray him and all the disciples could run away and leave him alone to face the cross. Peter, though, picked up a sword and Peter, Jesus told him, Peter, you're a fisherman. Put the sword away. If I wanted violence, I have 500 legions of angels at my command. Jesus willingly went to the cross for you and for me. He chose to place himself into the hands of wicked and evil men so that we could have forgiveness and a new life surrounded by his love so let us live with the confidence of that love. The Bible says the lot is cast, but every decision is from the Lord. People, we use chance to make decisions. We flip coins, we shake the dice, we cast lots. 
but God himself makes every decision final. And the decision God makes is the decision to love us. And he's been making this decision since the beginning. Jesus' cross is the culmination of it. But think back to when it began. Adam and Eve decide life without God would be a little bit more interesting than life with God. And suddenly they realize they're naked and they're ashamed. And God stands not in judgment but in compassion. And he offers them clothing. And he offers them the promise of a Savior. He chooses, he decides to stick with Adam and Eve. Their children and grandchildren and children go on until the world becomes filled with sin and God decides, let's try washing it. But he doesn't just wash it all clean in a flood. He saves and chooses Noah and keeps him aside. And then advance them a few more hundreds or thousands of years. And now the people of God are enslaved in Egypt. And God once again decides. He chooses to rescue them. He sends Moses. He sends the plagues. He takes them through the Red Sea. He leads them to the Promised Land. God chose for his people once again. And then they are settled in the Promised Land and life devolves pretty quickly. They pick leaders like judges and kings, and a few of them are good, but most of them are bad. And in that whole process, as it gets worse and worse, God chooses to send prophets to call people back to a faithful relationship with him. And when even the prophets are ignored and the wickedness comes to the fulfillment of its time and exile is the only solution, God keeps beside a remnant keep the truth, to keep the faith, to remember that they are loved by God. So when we get to the cross, we see it as one more step in this pattern of God choosing us again and again. He regularly has that option. We might cast the lot to make a decision, but God has decided. God has decided for us. So the Roman soldiers are throwing the dice to decide who gets that fifth and final piece of clothing. Jesus is on the cross deciding to love you and me, to bring us forgiveness. Because there on the cross, he pays for the sins that we're supposed to pay for. There on the cross, he dies the death that we deserve. But he made that decision on our behalf. So my brothers and sisters, can we live with some confidence, some confidence in God's love and his acceptance of us? Or will we give in to fear and will we allow something else to control us? The lot is cast, but every decision is from the Lord. God has decided. He decided to love us. He decided to save us. We belong to him. Amen. Would you stand and join me for the prayers of the church? Folks, if you saw Andy walk out, um, Andy's wife Michelle ended up with maybe a medical emergency, so she's going to be the first person we pray for. We bow our heads. God, our Father, we come before you and we pray for our sister Michelle. We ask that you would bless her Help the doctors, the technicians, the folks who are working on her to figure out what's wrong. Help her to recover. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God, our Father, you remind us again and again that you are in charge, but you have placed people in positions of authority. You grant them that authority so they could lead well, so your people could live simple, peaceful, quiet, godly lives. Therefore, we are bold to pray for the president of our nation, Joseph Biden, the governor of our state, Jared Polis, for Matthew Harrison and James Maxwell, who lead our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and our Rocky Mountain District, for these men and for all men and women that you have placed in authority, God. Bless them. Bless those who advise them. Bless those who carry out their directives. Help them all to lead well so we might lead we might live simple, peaceful, quiet, godly lives. In our world, marred as it is by sin, Father, we pray knowing that you have overcome the world. 
So trusting in you, we are bold to pray for health, justice, and peace in our world. And we thank you for those we know who work towards those goals, particularly Kathy and Shelley and Keith, Blake and Todd and Connor and Nick. In your word, O Lord, you declare one generation commends your deeds to another. We humbly ask for the privilege of being a congregation that is called by you to do this faithful and loving work. We thank you for the friends we've made over the years of our short-term mission trips in Cambodia and in Guatemala, the opportunities you give us now through Lutheran Bible translators, and for the next place you would have us go and serve. Finally, Father, we pray for the needs of the individuals known to us, people who need your grace. Maybe it's a touch of healing. Maybe it's simply your comforting presence. We pray for Patricia and Sheila and Linda and Ruth, for Diana and Donna and Sean, for Carrie and Jerry and Matthew, for Andrew and Donald. Father, in the end, we come before you and remember not only these individuals, but we remember you. Because, Jesus, you are the one that taught us to think of God as a good, kind, wise, loving Father who delights in hearing from his children. And you taught your followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as, as against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord not only hears our prayers, he comes to us. We believe that somehow in, with, and under these elements of the Lord's Supper, Jesus is somehow present for us. We believe this because we take the scriptures at face value. In Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, and in 1 Corinthians, words like these are found. Our Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Then in the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now may God's peace be with you. Please be seated. We'll continue our simple tradition of a walking communion. I'll be the first person you'll come to. I'll have the host, the bread. If you have an allergy to wheat, I have some gluten-free wafers. Behind me, one of our elders will be standing carrying the chalice, the common cup, probably like Jesus used with his disciples in the upper room. Behind him will be another one of our elders with the individual glasses. Remember, if alcohol is not something you want in your life, the row closest to the elder is always the non-alcoholic option. We are a church that takes God's word seriously, and that includes 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where when Paul's talking about the Lord's Supper, he says, failing to discern the body of Christ, someone can eat and drink judgment on themselves. So if you're not yet a believer, if you're not yet instructed, this isn't for you yet. You're welcome to come forward, but let me give you a blessing rather than maybe do harm. I think that's everything we need to cover. Let's begin by communing our elders first.
receive this blessing. May this body and blood of our Lord and our Savior bless and strengthen you and keep you until our Lord returns. Go in peace. Amen. We bow our heads for prayer. God, our Father, we ask that you would bless us in this week to come to focus on Jesus' great love for us as seen in the Passion. He willingly entered Jerusalem knowing the cross was in his future because, because we were on his mind. So help us to rejoice in the love that he shares with us. Help us to live with the confidence that belongs to the well-loved people of God. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Before our final song, a few announcements. This is Holy Week. It kicks off today on Palm Sunday. Uh, so here's what our schedule looks like. The Chosen Bible Study is still meeting. That's going to be Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Um, on Thursday, we are going to meet here in person for Monday Thursday worship. Uh, that's where Jesus in the upper room institutes the Lord's Supper for the first time after washing his disciples' feet. On Friday at 7 p.m., we'll gather for our Good Friday service, where we remember Jesus on the cross and his passion for us. On Easter, if you come for the 1030 service, you're going to be late. Uh, on Easter, our schedule changes a little bit. We're going to have our first service, our completely traditional service. That's going to be at 7 a.m. That's our sunrise service. After that service, breakfast will be available down in the basement. About 9 o'clock or so, there'll be an egg hunt and family fun out on the lawn. And then uh, 10 o'clock, we're going to have our festival service. That'll include our, our regular praise team, but we're also going to bring in the organists and the choir. We're going to pile it all together to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Right after church this morning, a uh, a couple of things are going to be going on. We're going to be changing some decorations in here, so if that's something you like to do, you're welcome to stay in here and help with that. We're also going to be stuffing candy in Easter eggs. So if you like candy, or you like to help in that way, um, we'll be doing that out in the lobby. Um, and I think that's it for announcements. Um, oh, thank you. We are, a, uh, our offerings here not only go to support the ministry of Christ our Savior, but we are an Operation Christmas Child Church. And so part of what we give to our God in our offerings goes to make sure that kids who otherwise wouldn't get a Christmas present get a Christmas present. Um, and we'll have fun packing up those boxes this next fall. Uh, I have some hamantaschen, uh, which are the official cookie of Purim. Um, so I'll put those out in the coffee bar. Uh, and uh, technically they're called, uh, you know, if it translates out of the Yiddish, uh, Haman's ears. Um, <laughs> I always thought it was Haman's hat, but I spent a bunch of time on YouTube watching uh, Jewish cultural videos this week and <laughs> got corrected. So uh, join me for a hamantaschen, and then you can either come in here and help with putting up uh, eat, uh, the, the decorations for Holy Week, or you can sit with me and eat candy and pack Easter eggs out in the lobby. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Should we, we're going to sing, right? Oh, that's right. There's another song, isn't there? Yeah, we're, we're going we're, to... We're, just saying, we're, we're without a drummer, so we have to... So he took off okay. to the ER, so... Um, All right. So we're going we're gonna to do our best. All right. So, so this God's is kind so of loved. A, okay, let's sing God's so loved.
laid them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. All right, now we're going to go eat hamantaschen. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. 